Yes, presence. Presence is good, right? The if and, <laughs> and oftentimes when we express so my hope today is as I talk about the effects of the presence of God, it hopefully kind of gives you a grid for some of the stuff that we're experiencing. Um, if you've been in, in our community for the last like two months, I think it was the Sunday, I, I remember there was a marked shift in what God began to do this Sunday just before Resurrection Sunday, which was Palm Sunday. Interesting, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. That's an interesting time. So we, we, we began to say Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. And, I, and there's been a real marked shift in what I see God doing in our midst, in our community. And so for, for some of us, it, it might be unusual for us. And, and one of the things I want to tell you is like, you know, when you invite your friends over to our church, just tell them, hey, you know what? Um, it might not be what you're accustomed to, but I guarantee you have an encounter with God. I promise you, you're going to have an encounter with God. Um, Sharon was telling me about a, a shirt that um, a, a common friend of us, Tom Scarella, has. He, his, the shirt says, I got, wa- how's it go? I got wasted and drunk. I got drunk. I got drunk. I got high and listened to loud music. That was my service. How was yours? <laughs> he got high on Jesus. I, I heard drunk in the spirit. You know, I, I heard. I heard one guy. And this might if this messes with your religiosity. I, I, please just have grace on me. He says, "Boy, I get so high. It feels like I'm on Jehovah Wana." <laughs> <laughs> that probably messes with your religiousness a little bit. I know the first time I heard it, I was like, I don't know, what, what's he saying? He says, boy, Jehovah Wana is so good. Uh, and th- that, that happens because, you know, we, we've, we've made a decision. I remember a couple of Sundays ago, we made a decision, and we talked, Kayla talked about it, that we're, we're not going to have life as usual. It's not going to be business as usual. And so we, we're making that determination to see the fullness of God being expressed and extended in all areas. And so I remember like 20 years ago, I read this book and it says, you know, like it, it, it was a book about church growth. And it says, you know, you should make sure and all the weird stuff, don't do it on Sunday. Just kind of shove it to the side and put it on the side of the week. I was saying, boy, I'm breaking every rule in that book for good reasons. <laughs> because the reality is, you guys remember when Marshall was here, he says it's the craziest thing to say, okay, let's push our, all of the stuff that we, want, we, we, we know we want God to show up, but we don't know how it would show up. So if we don't know how it would show up, that means we can't control it, Right? So really, when you say, hey, God, I want you to show up this way, you're basically saying, God, let me be in control. You take second seat, right? It's like Andre, take the wheel, right? Andre, take the wheel. The song just doesn't work that way. You know, like, David, take the wheel. Get in front. You know, it's just, that's, you all don't know that reference, that country singer reference? Jesus, take the wheel. It just doesn't work that way when it's your name, take the wheel, right? Re- replace your name and take the wheel. And so we have to get comfortable with God doing stuff, right? And I use this reference all the time, and I'm going to do a few more of these types of references. But think about it. If you're in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, and the Bible reads, the day of Pentecost came and it was fully come, there came a sound from heaven like of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. So I'm going to do this little thing. If I do, that's not even a Russian win, right? But this is as close of a Russian win I can get. Like, after a while, everyone's like, stop, that's a little annoying. Like, don't, don't do that, right? But if that comes from heaven and that sound comes, obviously what begins to happen is we, we begin to say, okay, Lord, what are you doing? I, I don't quite know what you're doing. And, and, and that's why... Um, when I go places and I see it says, come out to, f- come out to uh, 12 o'clock, I'm sorry, 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, or 1 o'clock service. Don't worry about it. It will be identically the same. How is that possible? How is it possible to have a service that's identically the same? 
That means God decided, okay, I'm going to move this way, exactly this way, this time, every time. Jesus never even healed anyone the same way, the same time, every other way. How is it possible to have a service that's identical every single time? I, I don't, I don't. Okay, uh, Thelma's making trouble now. Thelma's making <laughs> That's, the, the, the only way it could be is if you're in control. That, that's really the only way. Is if you want to make sure you control the narrative, you control what you see, you, you make it a production. And, and we're, we're not, we're not going to do that. We're, as, as a community, we, we want, if God says, you know what, let's bring Kiki up here to sing some of these songs. Let's bring Kiki up here to sing some songs. That we'll do, that's how we'll do it, right? That, that's kind of how it is. You know, like five minutes before service, I say, hey, Carol. Why don't you take the last verse of that? Kyle gives me the bug out look like, mm-hmm. what you say? What you talking about, Pastor Andre? <laughs> what you talking about, Pastor Andre? But we, we just try to go with the flow as, as much as we could. And, and sometimes it's, it's like, God, I'm not quite sure what you're doing. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but hey, I'll flow with it the best way I could. And oftentimes, this happens in your own life as well, too. Oftentimes, when you're hearing from God, I kind of equate it to if you're a surfer, it's like riding a wave. You paddle, 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 and you're going up. But once you catch the top of the crest, it's just sailing all the way through. And so I I, want to encourage you, like, you know, get comfortable with it. Like, when you tell your friends, hey, listen. This is not going to be. This is not your regular church service, right? But you're going to experience something, and I promise you, in all you you will experience the things of God. God will show up in life because I don't think we've had uh, anyone that's ever come into our environment, regardless of what they create, their background, their whatever, and they said, "No, no, didn't experience an encounter from God in Encounter Church." I don't think that's ever said. No one ever, right? Said no one ever. But you often sometimes have to, if you, want to, if you think of a mango, you have to peel the outside of it to get to that juicy fruit. You want to get to the, the meat of the matter. And, and God's like that. Um, if, if you notice in the, in the Old Testament that God, and even the New Testament, when things would happen, God would start engaging in questions. And he would start going back and forth. Say, Who do men say I am? I don't know who you say. Like... And the whole point of him engaging is that he has these secrets that he wants you to co-labor with him and explore to find out these secrets of heaven. You know, we, we, we were talking about one at the men's meeting yesterday. It's like a scripture we've been reading for many years. And boom, someone just kind of showed a different side of it. It's like, wow, that's so amazing. Because God's in the business of saying, hey, let's co-labor together and let's find these secrets together. So when I think of the, the presence of God and the effects of what the presence of God is, um, the first thing that I, if I could get a click on that, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah. All this time he's sitting back there, he moves to the camera for two seconds, and then I'm like, oh, I decide to click at that point. And, and so the, the, when God comes and when he shows up, he shows up often in signs and wonders. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 5, and I kind of stole that picture from Kayla's message last week. Y'all, y'all notice that? <laughs> that was Kayla's picture from last week. It says, The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. This is the beginning of the book of Acts. And if you remember in the... In the book of Acts, it was like the birth of the church. God began to do amazing things. And there's these two words that's recorded there. The Bible talks about signs and wonders that are, that are being recorded. So let's just kind of do a little etymology of that word, signs and wonders. The Greek word for sign um, is the word simeon. And it kind of means exactly as it says. It's something that points to something else, right? So it's a sign. Now, Here's one thing I want you to know about a sign. And when God's doing a sign and a wonder, when he's doing a sign, the whole point of a sign is to point you to someone else. Let's think about this for a second. If you're at uh, 95, if you're heading home and you're trying to get to your next location, there's usually signs in the street that said, 95, this way. 
Have you ever noticed at the 95 sign, there's four or five cars parked up at the 95 sign looking at it like, wow, what a great sign. Man, 95 that direction. Wow. Tampa, that way. Wow. Great sign. Woo, amazing. Have you ever seen that? Did nobody ever, right? No one camps around signs. It's unreasonable to camp around signs. When we see a sign, what is it doing? It's pointing to a greater reality. That sign says, Tampa, that direction. So when I say, aha, I see where that's going, I'm heading towards Tampa. Tampa is my destination. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm heading, I'm looking for the reality of what Tampa is. When we think of signs and wonders of the kingdom, we're not, and a sign could be anything, a healing, a miracle, God showing up supernaturally, you're feeling something in your body, whatever that sign could be. Wow, it's amazing. Great. I could feel God. Great. What next? What's it pointing to? It's pointing to a greater reality of the heart of the Father. It's pointing your heart towards Jesus for you to realize, I saw this. I saw this miracle. So now that points to Jesus. I saw this healing. That points to Jesus. I saw metal plates dissolve. Uh, I could see that points to Jesus. Cancer disappear. Point to Jesus. All of it is pointing to reality of the majesty and the grace of who Jesus is. So it's really kind of crazy for me to say, oh my gosh, what a miracle. This miracle is awesome. All we'll do is talk about the miracle forever and ever. Yeah, we rejoice at the miracle. We absolutely do. But we know the more miracles we see and the more we experience is the more it's pointing to that gritty reality of the kingdom. Amen? So that's point number one with signs. It points to a greater reality. Um, uh, yeah, so no one camps around a sign, and no one, we know that a sign points to a greater reality. I'll give you another cruel example. Um, you, 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 you're ever um, seen at a memorial service, they have a picture of the person who passed on, and that person obviously. The, everyone's there and they're sorrowful and they're sad when that person has passed on. You ever went to the widow or the widower and they say, why are you crying? You have this great picture of him. You have this great picture of her. Why, why are you crying? Look, you could see him right here. He's right there. So just looking at the memorial, just fixing your eyes on the memorial is, is, is cruel. No, no, no one does that. No, no one goes and gets married, and they, they say, wow, I'm so happy that I'm married. And they go to the photographer, collect all the pictures, and spend the rest of the days of their life watching wedding pictures. Who does that? No one. Because all of these things point to something greater. It points to a greater reality. Now, the word wonder is a Greek word... Uh, I believe the word is pronounced te teras, right? And it's, um, it's defined as uncertainty or, or a, well, it, it defines as something uncertain and something that makes you wonder. So an easy way to remember what a wonder is, a wonder is a something that makes you wonder, right? Pretty, pretty easy, right? So if God begins to do something that makes you like, wow. That's pretty cool, God. That's awesome. That, that's amazing. You know? It ma makes you wonder. What it should do, it should begin to whet your appetite for more. Right? It, it should begin to whet your appetite to say, I, I know you did it there, so don't you tell me he can't do it. And then you say, let's do this one again. Right? So it, it makes you wonder. Like, God, I know you could do it. So um, <laughs> I'm listening to a testimony this week of, uh, uh, of the fish, the testimony of the fish. And here, here's this testimony. So th these two people within our community, they had a dead fish in their house. It's okay. Pray. First the fish kind of had this back look like it was dead. But then that fish began to dart off and try to spin, like swim like it was like, come on. 
Why would God want to raise a fish? Why would God? Because the next time you see someone in the hospital that's sick and going, you're like, you know what? I, I remember when he, he, I remember when that fish came back to life. When everybody's looking around and we're saying, oh, that fish looked dead. I mean, I, I was listening to the story that was described to me. The fish was like, it, it was kind of looking okay, but when they came to pray for the fish, it started to look worse. And they're like, oh my goodness, this fish looked dead. But then as they began to pray, this fish came back to life. This fish began to show great signs of life. And, and the fish had some other issues too, with something else was happening with the fish, and the fish was not looking in good shape. But wh- why? Why would God do that? He, he's doing that to show you there's a greater reality. He's doing that to show you, to lift your eyes towards heaven, to see there is things, in, there are wonders that he wants you to see. And he wants to point these wonders to, these wonders show a greater reality. So, I'm going to run through these like super, super quick. So, here, here are all the things. This, these are like four or five things that I've, pointed out and are found within the scripture that happens when the presence of God comes, when the God begins to impart of himself. This was in Genesis. It says, and God, for the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took his rib and closed up the flesh at that place. And I've always said God had to put a guy to sleep if he won't snatch one of his ribs. Because if you ever see me with a plate of ribs in front of me, you have to put me to sleep to take my ribs from me. <laughs> okay. That's so why I know right now. But often, but I, I, I want to just kind of let you know, sometimes when the presence of God comes, he puts you in a deep sleep, right? And I'm just saying it's a physical reaction to what happens. And I'm not talking about, like, I'm preaching too long and I'm dozing off in church. That's not the deep sleep I'm talking about, right? That's not the deep sleep I'm talking about. I'm talking about when your heart, the Bible says that whilst I sleep, my heart is awake. I've noticed many times that when I go to bed at night, And I begin to point my heart towards heaven. I begin to get into this deep realm of sleep. And I think there's two reactions here with God just kind of imparting unto you this deepness of sleep. In the physical realm, I think it happens in the physical realm. Like the the presence of God is so upon you that he allows you to to sleep even deeper. And I think it's like, even, even for your physical body, like you might know how much you're going and going, and he just wants to slow you down to speak to you in that night watch. And you're like, I, I, I slept a lot last night, but I, I wasn't that tired. Aha. Uh-huh. As, it, as it says on, uh, uh, on, on um, coming to America. Aha. Uh-huh. Aha. Uh-huh. God's doing something. And these are effects that happen of the presence of God. I'm, I'm not talking about if there's a physiological thing in your body and, and you don't go to see a doctor. That, that's, that's different. I'm talking about there are certain realms of sleep that I believe that the Father would put in your life at certain periods of time. And, and you can't explain how you slept so deeply. And I think what's happening in the background, that sounds a Solomon passage where it says, whilst I sleep, my heart is awake. So God kind of says, you know, why don't you take a quick nap here and let me work through this process with you. And God begins to do certain things in your heart. So that's just one of the things that I've kind of noticed with that. And and of course, when when you think of um, that text in particular, when the Bible says that the Lord caused the man to get into a deep sleep, the verse after it says that I would bring a helper suitable for him. Interestingly enough, God, you, you have to be in a place of no performance so that you can allow the Lord to come in with his help. We've got to learn to work like it's up to us, but rest like it's up to God. Because if you're trying to do your performance action, if you're trying to 
manufacture righteousness, manufacture holiness, try to perform for God. He's got to like, why don't you take a little rest? Why don't you rest in me? Why don't you rest in him? And in that rest is where he's able to show up. So I find that to be interesting about that element. And that's just a natural part of um, experiencing the presence of God. The, the next thing that happens, and this is biblically, um, in Ezekiel chapter thir- 3 and verse 23, it says, So I got up and went out to the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord standing there, there like the glory I saw by the river Shabar, and I fell on my face. It shouldn't be, if you've always wondered, hey, why do I fall on my face? What happens in this process? I just kind of pull some biblical scriptures to help you out there. It's biblical when the glory of the Lord comes that sometimes the reaction that you have is that you fall on your face. That's just kind of how it is. Does everyone fall on their face? No. But if you happen to fall on your face, don't say, oh my gosh, I tripped. No, it was just God showing up. And then he kind of imposes of his heart into you. And it, what, what's interesting about this particular text, this was actually a commissioning of Ezekiel. Um, and and he, he fell on his face. The actual verses before this verse, this is chapter 3, verse 1, was if you remember in that text, Ezekiel, the Lord told him to go eat the scroll. And what a scroll is, if you know from ancient times, it's, it's like, think of a piece of paper with two pieces of wood at the end, and they kind of roll it in and out, you know. And, and a scroll, of course, is symbolic of the, the Word of God. And it's kind of not normal to, like, eat a scroll, right? Unless the scroll was made by those people from Cake Wars, you know, like, those men. I don't see myself eating a scroll anytime soon, right? But God will tell you to do things that are outside of your normal thought process. And I think it was the obedience of Ezekiel where the Lord says, hey, why don't you go grab that scroll and eat it? Why don't you do the thing that's unusual? And how many times did God will give you some like unusual things to do? He would say, okay, do this, do that. And you'll be like, oh, not, quite, not quite sure, not quite sure. That's kind of ever happened to you before? You're like, mm. But I think it's in the obedience of when he's, the, the simple obedience, the simple words that he would ask you to do, is when you'll be able to, you, it connects you into an overwhelming sense of the presence of God. And you literally could fall on your face. You, you literally could experience it. it you know, um, I, I was just so amazed just uh, Friday night just watching some Todd White videos with Aaron. On, we, we're looking at this guy who is completely dressed up um, like a Satanist. And he's got the ec- extra red contacts. His face got um, um, the, the white. He pasted his face with white. He's got some horns on him. And Todd just said, hey, let me pray with you. And Todd started to pray with him. And just a simple obedience of going and connecting with him. Then next thing you know, Todd gets a word from me. He says, I see, have you always wanted to, I think, make video games, do video game graphics? The guy was like, yeah. And as Todd began to give him more and more prophetic words, he began to engage more and more. And then I just began to, I could start looking at this little kid, this, this little kid, it's like a teenager, probably 18 about. As I started looking at his face, and Todd is translating for him, I could see his heart melting. I could see God just overflowing his heart and overflowing into his life, just by the simple obedience. Just by that simple obedience. And so I, I want to encourage, and I think this is kind of like an ongoing theme uh, with us, um, Wherever you are, and, and I, I know, here's, here's my challenge, right? So I, I'm in the store, and I've got Aaron in this hand. Or if I don't have Aaron, I have like 15 other things to do. And this happens to me more times than not. 
I see someone in the corner store, and I like, I get two pieces of information about them. I'm like, oh, boy, Jesus, what, what do I do now? What do I do now? Like, the right answer is go and engage, right? But believe it or not, I tested introverts on my ITNJ. So I'm not the guy who wants to go up and like, hey, you want to see Revival? <laughs> I leave that for Mark and Colleen, right? <laughs> but I, 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 I'm learning that as the reason why God will give you these little clues and these little hints is he wants you to take a chance. He wants you to try. He wants you to try to engage the presence of God w- wherever you are. Right, um, we 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 had a, an interesting time um, last Tuesday night. We we had uh, Wednesday night in our time of prayer. We decided to specifically go in after and praying for people in the LGBT community. We, and and I gotta tell you, in Canada's Church, I love you guys with everything, because in that prayer meeting, I felt the heart of God just so much and so powerful. It was not one of those meetings where I went away saying, I don't know if I agree with that prayer. I don't know if God is saying quite that. But as I, as I hear everyone began to pray and began to supplicate, and I began to cry out from their very hearts to see the love of God being displayed in this community, I was like, we're on to something. We're definitely on to something. There is definitely a movement. As much as that movement has taken up steam, there's a movement of God's people that has taken up more steam. And I could see it in in, in, an embryonic form taking place right here in our church. And I know that if our river is beginning to see it, I know there are many other streams within our church, within our community, around this county, around the world, that are beginning to experience the fullness of God in that way. But now... I, as we began to pray on, on that day, everyone was engaging the heart of heaven, the heart of the loving father going after the prodigal son, the heart of the king saying, son, come to my bosom, the heart of Jesus being displayed. And so what we did was we did something really practical after that. I sent everyone on a little treasure hunt. I said, hey, now that God has empowered us, why don't we go ahead and ask the Lord to show us someone who is in that lifestyle, and let's go after them to pray for them. And the, I, I got really distinct details about mine. And that person works in my office. Oh, my God. You think I'm a little nervous? Like, okay, how am I going to do this? I don't want to be a weird guy. I gotta fit. So I'm saying, Lord, you didn't just show me her for no reason at all. So I'm saying, Lord, show me how I engage what heaven is saying for this individual. person works in marketing somewhere. I don't know if they're meeting back. They're back in the, working from home, working from wherever. But I saw in the company my, my, um, directory. And then I go on her, um, on her Facebook, not Facebook page, her LinkedIn page, and it's got full gambit of rainbows. I'm like, okay, I think I know why Jesus showed me this. The whole point is when the power of God comes, when we fall on our face, it's not when we stay on the floor, but what happens when we go to the door. And so as we began to pray about that community and pray that God will begin to dig in and God begin to show himself in love is where we, in turn, must activate what God has done in them, in our lives. Sometimes when the power of God comes upon you, you experience something called holy fear, right? And here's why I call it holy fear. In Daniel chapter, that's really chapter 8, but it's uh, six, uh, 17, it says, So he came near where I was, and when he came, I was frightened and fell to my face. Sometimes when the power of God comes near to you, you, began, you begin to feel something in your on you that feels something like fear. And I, I don't really have language for this, but what I do know is that it's fearful, like, ooh. But it's like, yeah. It's like, yeah, and yeah. 
emotion at the same time. And I think the only thing I could equate it to, and if this has ever happened to you, you would know, if you've ever been in the presence of a head of state of a, of a nation, like the president of a country, right, there is a sense of awe for the office that is right there. And, and I've heard people talk about this when, regardless of who they voted for, whenever they've met the president of the country, there is a sense of, wow, this is the awe of the office that's here, right? Even though you didn't vote for said individual. And so there's a sense of, I, I, I got to make sure I do this right. I, there's, but then there's a sense of gratitude in the sense of, yes, I'm in the presence of, uh, this is an honor to be here. And I think that I think is the best description I could give of Holy Fair. I remember, remember when Dr. Hiles was here, <laughs> he said he had to go meet George W. Bush because George W. Bush got his first book. He said he had to go take a class to know how to use a knife and forks on his thing. He says, as far as he knew, if you have mashed potatoes at the end of your spoon, you lick it off and you could use that for your dessert. <laughs> right? He says that the entire night, his, the one thing on his mind was, God, make sure I don't mess up this tie. <laughs> I don't want gravy fall on my tie, right? Because he's, he, he, in his words, he says, I'm a country boy from Virginia, right? And he's going to meet the president of the free world, the president of these United States, right? And I think that, so multiply that feeling by gazillion is what happens when you, the power of God comes down, and you're feeling the sense of awe, but it's the sense of gratitude that, wow, I'm in the presence of a king. I'm in the presence of a great king. And so you may experience that. You may feel that whenever you're, um, when God is upon you. The next thing, no surprise. We knew this before it was even written in the Bible. They shook and fell. <laughs> This is, here's the good news about this one. Matthew chapter 28, it says, The guards shook and fell from fear, and they became like dead men. I don't, these guards were Roman soldiers. So I don't know how much of a grid for the gospel they had. I don't know how much of a grid for the things of God they have. So that says to me that when the power of God comes, if you're on the street, if you're in public, it's okay because you might see things happen, you'll be like, ooh, right. I saw this happen in church one time, and you fall the power of God in aisle five. This is interesting. I don't know what to do. I didn't touch her. It wasn't me. And so I, I, I just kind of want to throw that out there. Kind of expect that. You, you're going out there and praying for people. You might have, and this story is the, the reference with um, the, the guard. This is after Jesus by the tomb. And the angel of the Lord came and sat on the tomb. And those guards shook and they fell and they just went like dead men. I mean, just the glory of that angel. I mean, this angel is popping that big stone from in front of the tomb of Jesus, right? I, I mean, listen, if I see something popping a tomb from the... I, 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 I don't feel like me. I wonder if these guards are like, I better just pretend I'm dead so that angel won't see me. <laughs> I've always wondered that about this text. But regardless of what it is, these guys are Roman soldiers, and they know that if anyone comes and takes Jesus, they're under the penalty of death. Right? Caesar's not playing around. He's like saying... Oh, where's my prisoner? We lost him. You lost him? It's not a TV show. Is it? You ain't Jack Bauer. Like, no. What do you mean you lost? What do you mean you lost Jesus? The, the king of the Jews? What, what happened? I, I don't know. The, the angel came down, moved the stone away. Jesus came. I saw it was uh, the, the, the grave clothes folded like a napkin and put up there. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what happened. And I, I believe that when the power of God is displayed and God begins to show of himself, it, re, it shows of himself even to the, to the unbeliever, even to the unsaved, even to the unreached. So I don't want you to be afraid that when you begin to share the work of God, when you begin to declare Jesus to those that don't know him, that 
they, they're not going to experience him. Because I, I know everyone in this, some of us in this room got testimonies of praying for people that are not Christians, and you've seen reactions like, I know that's God, I have no answer for it, I have no description for it, but I know that's God. And so, be not surprised when you see someone shake and fall, just as you saw in that text, and they're not even a Christian. Much less for us that are believers. See, uh, let me just one more say this thing. Oftentimes, as we, um, in our community, we often experience something first, and then we end up finding a scripture to support it later. In many communities, it's the opposite way around. They read the scriptures, it comes alive, and then it happens. So I'm hoping that what I'm sharing with you, it kind of gives you like, okay, I'm I'm actually doing something from the Bible now. This is in the Bible. This is great. I didn't know this was in the Bible, but I'm glad you told me it's in the Bible. And the last one, Acts chapter 10 and verse 10, don't get scared. It's in the Bible. (laughs) Acts 10, 10 says, he became hungry and wanted to eat. And while they were making preparations, this is Peter's talking about, he fell into a trance. Okay, so let, let me start by saying, not because the New Agers and the, those that don't know Jesus fall into trances means that trances are bad, right? I could use a dollar to give to Sandra to go take care of kids in um, El Salvador, and I could use a dollar to buy drugs, Right? It, it is an, it, it's a, it, 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 it doesn't have a, it's an amoral thing, right? And, and likewise, and, and so, but, but by definition, let me see if I could grab a quick definition here for you so it, you, you can understand what it is. Trance is, is a state of semi consciousness in which a person is not self aware. And it's either altogether unresponsive to external stimuli or selectively responsive in the following, selective responses in following directions to to the person who has induced the trance. Does that sound like what happened to you in worship today? Be honest. (laughs) That kind of sound like that happened to me at least one or two times. Let Let me read the definition again for you. Trance. A state of semi-consciousness in which a person is not self-aware and is either altogether unresponsive to external stimuli or is selectively responsive following the directions of a person who has induced a trance. That happens in worship all the time. But I hope I didn't use, don't let the word trance scare you. Because Peter fell in one. That's in the Bible. I, I didn't pull a, a, a crazy text from anywhere. Right? And, and, and so when you're in the presence of God, right, and it happens often in our, in, in our time of in, encounter night, we're out, we don't know what's happening, right? I mean, we're like... You, you ever heard someone under the power of God and said, yeah, you were doing that. I was doing what? I was, I, what did you say? I, I don't remember that. I don't remember that. But I, I, what my hope today is to give you permission. To say, Lord, whatever you want to do, you get to do it. I, my, that, that's my hope to give you permission. And of course, when, I give, when, when we give permission for this... We give permission to open the doors for the craziest of the craziest things. It's okay. I'd rather have wildfire than no fire. That's what me and Caleb, we said. We'd rather have wildfire than no fire. So like, okay. In a bag of Skittles, in a bag of trail mix, there's stuff that we eat and there's stuff that we don't eat. It's okay. Let, Let all of them come. We, we, as a spirit leaders, we'll pick out the nuts and we'll push the nuts to the side. <laughs> simple, simple, simple thing. We just pray the Lord will show us which one is nuts and we're not throwing out the real. 
because oftentimes, like we 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 get we have the opportunity to read these stories in the prism of time. We're looking in the rearview mirror and saying, "Oh, and he came hungry and he fell into a trance." That's in the prism of time. But whilst it's happening, you're not like thinking, "What's happening here? What's what's really going on here?" And I want you to give yourself permission. That if God is leading you, if you're feeling something, if God has touched your heart in some way, and it it creates a reaction in you that you're not familiar with, it's okay. It's okay. I mean, let's think about something as simple as, like last week, we had up on stage here two people who said, I don't want to be on stage. That's a great reaction. I mean, I tell you, the, the first day... Like one of the first times when um, when when Mary joined and, and Frank joined our community, I remember Mary telling Kayla, Pastor Kayla, whatever you do, you could put me in the back, put me to do this, put me to bring flowers, put me to do this, whatever you do, do not put me on stage, do not put me anywhere where I have to talk in front of people. Whatever you do, don't do I mean, that was like, it was like, we probably have a contract back in the church office somewhere with that written. It's got to be. Like, I remember that very clearly. And I, I'm sitting right on this seat here on Sunday. And I'm saying, it, that's Mary up there. Like, is, are you seeing this? Did, did you see, like, hey, did you all see that? And then the next thing was Veronica. I'm like sitting here. I'm like, revival is here. Like nobody could tell me revival's not here. Like I, I don't know if I don't remember anything Veronica said. God help me. I don't remember anything she said. I was just in trouble. Like, wow, she she's up there, right? When when the Kalers came, we, we had a, a meeting with with the Kalers, some of our lead team. Veronica's at the meeting, right? The power of God hits Veronica, and she goes home, and she says she falls asleep. Remember that deep sleep thing we talked about? She said that doesn't happen to her. She said that doesn't happen to her. She goes at, at night. She's scrolling through Facebook. She's reading something. She, she's reading the, the, the Chronicles of Narnia. I don't know what. She, like she's up late at night reading something. That night, boom. We didn't really finish too late that night anyway. It was like we're like there forever, like... Man, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Revival's still here. And Veronica's going up to say, no. It's like a normal night. And the power of God came and she went into a deep sleep. No, no. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. So I'm saying, I'm saying, I, I'm, God help me not to put him in a box. I don't want to put my God in a box because the minute I do is when I lose. It's because I say, okay, you did it that way before, so if you're not doing it that way, I'm going to get lost. I I can't receive it. I'll give you one more story and then we'll close out. And I think I gave the story already, but it's well worth describing for this one. Mahesh Shav, the great man of God from um, uh, Fort Mills, South Carolina. He's, he's in Africa. He's praying. And as he's praying for people, they start coughing up blood. He's like, all right. What's going on here? What's happening? He's like, what, what, what's going on here? And he's simply inquired of the Lord. And the Lord says, I am cleansing generational curses from their bloodline. That's the, that's the manifestation. But I got to tell you, if somebody coughs up blood in one of our services, I'm freaking out. I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> I don't know if I'll have the presence of mind to ask, Jesus, what's going on here? I mean, my first reaction is to go get the oil. <laughs> and let's get, where's the deliverance team? Who do we train deliverance again? That's yours. Go handle them. <laughs> yeah. And that, my, my point is, when God is doing something... It mightn't look like the move from before. If it looked like the move of God in the past, th- then he's, he's not always going to do it like he did in the past. 
And it's okay if he did it in the past, but he might do something different now. The great Robert Slayerden, he said he remembered tw- 20 years ago, he, w- he would go in services and people would, would, would fall on the power of God. He's like, oh, great. And then he went to England for 10 years and he came back and he noticed no, nobody's fallen on the power of God anymore. And he's like, oh, wait a second. I notice everybody's laying on the ground now. We go into service and everybody's laying down. So the, the, the move where people are falling much, much more rapidly, and, and that still happens today because it happens in our community as well, God started to do something a little different where people would go into services and they would just dive on the ground and be like, oh, God, I just want to connect with you. So he's like, wow, they, they, we, we skipped the fall part and just went straight to the floor. That's interesting. God just decided to do that, this, this go around. And then it seems like things are coming somewhat cyclic. My point is, don't limit God. Don't limit what he's doing. Don't limit what he's saying. All right, let's stand. Let's stand together. So God, today, we give you full permission. That's why we sang, I gave myself away. The point is, we're here to give you full and complete permission. Full and complete permission. If you want to take us into a deep sleep, if you want to make a shake and fall, if you want to uh, put us in a trance, if you want us to experience that holy fear, whatever it is, We're taking it. We want it. That's why we sang, I give myself away. So, Father, we give ourselves completely and fully over to you. So, as we experience the fullness of who you are, as we experience you, As we experience and encounter you, we just give you full permission. Yesterday when I preached at my soccer group, these guys, I don't know if they had any. Some of them are Christians. I don't know if all of them are Christians. But I just said, hey, give yourself permission to experience God. And guys with, I don't think, with much grit for this, say, wow, I felt peace. Wow, I felt this. Wow, I felt that. Without any grit for this stuff. And so likewise, you may not have a grid for the next thing that God will do. You have a grid for shaking, falling, and that stuff. But you may not have a grid for the next thing God might do, whatever it might be of a feeling it might be. I remember this guy would, he, he, when he would pray for the sick, I think it was his left hand or his right hand would just get hot. He's like, I know God's in the room to do healing. So his hands would get super hot. And he would go lay hands on the sick and then we have lots of mir- miracles taking place. So I just say, I just want you go ahead and ask the Lord to come and touch you and just Give him permission to do something he hasn't done before. Just give him permission. He's a gentleman. He's going to engage you. It's Holy Spirit right now. I bless you. And I thank you. Open up our eyes to see visions. Open up our eyes to see things we haven't seen before. Because the whole point of it is that we not just encounter you, but we pass it on. The whole point is that we engage in a treasure hunt to go see what's outside of the four walls of this building and go release all of God. As we said it within, Kayla released it and prayed it. She said, you, you, you have to release what you have. In, in the kingdom, you only get to keep what you've given away. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So go ahead and, and, and do that. We'll do that for one more minute. And then we're going to change the order for a second and I'll tell you what we'll do next. So point of prayer that we want to hit on shortly. Let's go ahead and just ask him. Ask the Lord to do something different with you. Not for the sake of saying, hey, wow, look, he did something different. But for the sake of this thing being pointed towards heaven, you don't camp at the sign. You camp at a greater reality of what the sign produces, what the sign is pointing to. Some of you may be aware that uh, Miss Kathy, Kathy Shitty, who is part of our community, had a mild heart attack on Friday and Thursday. We just want to release you. You have been given something. And I want you to release what God has already given you for her right now, wherever you are, right where you're standing. Just go ahead and release the healing power of God in her direction. doctor says she has a long road to recovery it's, it's a little more serious than they thought but the good news is is that the God, we know a God that heals don't you tell me he can't do it so father we release of heaven's resources to Kathy's direction right now and I stand on the word that she said to me an hour before she went into surgery. She says, I am covered and I'm going to be fine. And I know she's covered by the power of God, covered by the blood of Jesus. And so I thank God for her. I thank God for the healing power of God. The same God that makes cancer disappear, that makes metal place dissolve that gets families reunited, that sees mental health restored, that same God is able to heal a heart. We release the power of God to bring complete healing to her. Healing, healing, healing. Thank you for healing her, Lord. Thank you for healing her, Lord. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for Milka as well. I know she was in the hospital recently, not sure for what. But we know that you're the God who heals. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. So I thank you that she will recover quickly from those kidney stones. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. 
You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Yes. Yes. As you go today, I just pray that you release what you've been given. Don't hold it to yourself. Look for opportunities everywhere you go to release of the glory and the goodness of God wherever you are. Take the fire of God with you and release it wherever you go. If you need prayer for anything, we'll be happy to pray with you. If not, God bless you.